Chapter 4. Michelangelo and Raphael The Big Question How is the spirit of the Renaissance represented in the artistic achievements of Michelangelo and Raphael? One day, a group of boys were called to the home of the incredibly important Lorenzo de' Medici. What could a man so rich and powerful, a man people called the Magnificent, want to tell these boys? Lorenzo looked at the boys and made an announcement. You see this stone figure, he said, pointing to an ancient Roman statue of a nature god called Afon. A brilliant sculptor created this piece centuries ago. I want each of you to carve a statue exactly like this one. Some of the boys groaned. Lorenzo paid no attention. Work quickly and accurately, he said. The young man who produces the best sculpture wins a place in my art school. Some time later, as Lorenzo strolled through his courtyard, he spotted one boy whose work looked far superior to the rest. He turned to his assistant and asked, Who is that child? Look at how he has carved the head of the fawn. It's difficult to tell his work from the real thing. The assistant checked his list. Let's see, Michelangelo Bonarotti, second son of former small-town mayor. Family is from minor nobility. Mother died when the boy was six. Hmm, not a very good Latin or Greek scholar. Ran away from school a lot. Ran away? Yes, it seems he sneaked away from school to go to the churches, where he spent hours drawing copies of the paintings. Ah, a true art lover, said Lorenzo. Well, his father isn't. The father is upset that Michelangelo works as an apprentice in Ghirlandaio's studio. He thinks he should pursue a different profession. Lorenzo walked up to Michelangelo and gazed at the fawn's head the boy had carved. That's a lovely sculpture, Lorenzo commented. Then he said, Young man, come live in our home and learn what you can from us. Lorenzo de' Medici's invitation was a great honor, but Michelangelo's father wasn't thrilled. His father changed his mind, however, when Lorenzo offered him a job and gave Michelangelo a beautiful cloak and a handsome sum of money. The Medici family was powerful and influential. They were involved in trade and banking. In the Medici household, Michelangelo discussed art and literature with the finest minds of the time. He studied the old masters in sculpture and painting. His stay with the Medici family launched his career in the art world. Michelangelo made it, and don't you forget it. On a stormy night in 1492 CE, Lorenzo de' Medici died. The sudden loss shocked the people of Florence. Michelangelo in particular lost a friend and a patron a man who had recognized the young artist's genius and supported him in his efforts. Reluctantly, Michelangelo left his beloved city. After some years of moving here and there, Michelangelo went to Rome. In Rome, a church official who had heard about the young sculptor's work offered him a job. He told Michelangelo to create something spectacular so that people would remember him, the church official, when he was gone. 24-year-old Michelangelo got to work immediately. In less than 12 months, he carved the stunningly beautiful Pieta. The sculpture shows Mary, the mother of Jesus, holding her son across her lap just after he was removed from the cross. The Pieta was placed in a great church of the Vatican in Rome, St. Peter's Basilica. Once, when Michelangelo went to St. Peter's to look at his creation, a group of visitors stood in front of it, trying to guess who carved the amazing work. No one guessed Michelangelo. That didn't make Michelangelo happy. Later, in the middle of the night, he returned to the basilica with hammer and chisel in hand. So there would be no question in the future. He carved his name on the sash that runs diagonally across Mary. As far as anyone knows, this is the only piece of art Michelangelo ever signed. From the giant 
comes the giant slayer. The Pieta made Michelangelo the most famous sculptor in Italy. In 1501 CE, he returned to Florence. There, officials of the cathedral showed Michelangelo a huge rectangular block of marble known as the giant. They showed him where another artist had begun to work on the huge block, but then made a mess of it. The officials challenged Michelangelo. Can you make something out of this? They asked. Michelangelo accepted the challenge. From the 20-foot block, he set out to carve a huge statue of David, the biblical hero who had used his slingshot to slay the giant enemy, Goliath. It took Michelangelo two and a half years to complete his statue of David. The figure stood almost 14 feet high and weighed 11,000 pounds. Like ancient Greek statues, Michelangelo's David shows a strong, muscular human form, almost a picture of perfection, a figure full of power and grace. Church Patronage, Julius II and Michelangelo Pope Julius II was a man of great ambition, determination, and energy. When his mind was made up, you wouldn't want to be in his way. And he had a terrible temper. In other words, he was a lot like Michelangelo. So when these two powerful personalities came together, sparks were bound to fly. Julius asked Michelangelo to come to Rome to construct a colossal tomb for him that would be built under the dome of St. Peter's Basilica. Julius was not modest. He wanted to be sure people remembered him. Michelangelo agreed and set to work hauling in tons of stone from the cliffs of Carrara, where he spent his childhood. After great labor and expense, Michelangelo filled St. Peter's Square with blocks of marble. But then Julius gave an order to stop work on this expensive project. He also refused to pay Michelangelo. An angry Michelangelo packed his bags and headed back to Florence. An even angrier Julius sent a messenger to demand that Michelangelo return to Rome. Michelangelo told the messenger he would return when the Pope paid what he owed him and stuck to his promises. Did the Pope apologize and pay Michelangelo? And did everyone live happily ever after? Definitely not. Julius sent furious commands to the leaders of Florence. Send Michelangelo back to Rome! he said, or I will send my armies to get him. A Florentine leader who was also a friend of Michelangelo suggested he return to Rome. After all, he told the angry artist, Florence did not wish to go to war for Michelangelo's sake. Painting the Sistine Ceiling It took months, but eventually Michelangelo did go back to Rome. When he arrived, the Pope had a job waiting for him. The Pope had decided that the tomb could wait. Instead, he wanted Michelangelo to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo refused. I am a sculptor, not a painter, he told the Pope. And the ceiling itself was immense. A huge, high, curved surface covering more than 5,800 square feet about twice as big as a tennis court. Michelangelo urged the Pope to give the job to someone else, but the Pope insisted. Michelangelo reluctantly agreed. Years before, when he worked as an apprentice, Michelangelo had learned the technique of fresco painting. In fresco painting, the artist applies a coat of wet plaster to a surface, then paints on the plaster. As the paint and plaster dry together, the painting will become a permanent part of the wall, or in this case, the ceiling. Michelangelo prepared to start the monumental task of painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. From the beginning, he and the Pope disagreed. Julius wanted the ceiling to portray the Twelve Apostles. Michelangelo wanted to paint scenes from the Old Testament, from the biblical story of creation to the story of Moses. At first, Michelangelo got help from several Florentine painters, but one by one he sent them away. He was a perfectionist. 
no one could meet his standards but himself. So he had to complete the grueling work on his own. From a scaffold high above the floor, Michelangelo had to bend and reach to paint the ceiling above his head. His neck and back ached terribly. His eyes grew strained. Pope Julius didn't make life any easier. He constantly urged Michelangelo to hurry. Finally, in October 1512 CE, after almost four and a half years of work, Michelangelo completed the ceiling. Great crowds hurried to the Vatican. They gazed in wonder at the ceiling. Just four months later, Pope Julius II died. The Pope never did get his colossal tomb in St. Peter's. The Great Raphael Raphael was another talented artist of the period. He was born Raffaello Sanzio in 1483 CE. He was younger than both Leonardo and Michelangelo. Raphael lost both of his parents at an early age. By 11, he was on his own, working as an apprentice in a busy art studio. In 1504 CE, when Raphael was 21, he moved to Florence, where Michelangelo and Leonardo were already living. There, he studied the techniques of the older artists and learned to use them in his own paintings. Remember, in those days, artists supported themselves by getting commissions from patrons. The wealthy people of Florence were eager to own beautiful paintings. By the time Raphael arrived, both Leonardo and Michelangelo were not painting as much. As he aged, Leonardo grew more interested in math and science and was reluctant to paint at all. Michelangelo's energies were consumed by big projects assigned to him by the Pope. So, young Raphael had many people ready to pay him to paint. While in Florence, Raphael created at least 17 paintings of the Madonna, or Mother of Jesus, and the Holy Family for various individuals. If you look at one of Raphael's Madonnas and compare it to a Madonna painted during the Middle Ages, you'll see how people's view of the world changed in the Renaissance. In the medieval image, the Madonna looks a little stiff. But the painting wasn't intended to be lifelike. Its main purpose was to express religious devotion. However, Raphael's painting is different. He presents natural human figures that are so lifelike, it is as if they could step out from the painting. Raphael in Rome In 1508 CE, Raphael was called to Rome by Pope Julius II. While Michelangelo was painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, Raphael was put in charge of painting a series of rooms in the Vatican. In one room, he painted a fresco, or mural, that has become very famous. It is called the School of Athens. The composition of the painting shows how Raphael was a great master of perspective, while the subject matter shows how much the Renaissance movement admired the ancient Greeks. Raphael painted many scholars and philosophers. Some are reading, some are discussing big ideas. In the center of the painting, Raphael placed the great philosophers, Plato and Aristotle. After Raphael's patron, Pope Julius II, died, Raphael became a special favorite of Pope Leo X. Leo put Raphael in charge of the work on St. Peter's Basilica. In addition, Raphael directed the efforts to dig up and study ancient buildings and statues in Rome. Raphael led a productive life. The artist died on his 37th birthday. Part of the epitaph on his tomb in Rome reads, while he lived, he made Mother Nature fear to be vanquished by him.